Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For you, it's very gratifying. It's, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it is my pleasure to warmly welcome, on behalf of RGSL, <coughs> our distinguished guests. First of all, President of the European Court of Justice of European Union, Professor Ken Lenertes, who visited uh, Latvia to launch his Latvian version of a book on the methods of interpretation of the, European, uh, of the EU law. I also welcome the Minister of Justice of the Republic of Latvia, Mr. Bordans, and judges of the Council Court of the Republic of Latvia. Last but not least, <laughs> Welcome Judge of the Court of Justice of the European Union, Professor Inete Zemele, our own professor in here in this, in this law school, who was a scientific editor of the Latvian translation of this book. Special welcome uh, to the team of the translators of the book. I spent some time to try to learn how to properly pronunciate your name in Latvian, but I apologize you know, <coughs> in advance, it, you know, I will make some mistakes. Uh, Mrs. Ilona Ciecica and uh, Kristaps Bezinc, uh, Inse Kurme, Ritvars Lacis, Lacis, Lacis Alexander Petrovs, and uh, Ainars Fremanis. Mm -hmm. Was close by? I mm -hmm. hope so. <laughs> yeah. You don't know what the Anglo Saxon could do with my surname, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <So> <laughs> <laughs> Better not try. And, uh, <laughs> and um, as I mentioned before, the scientific editor of the Latvian translation is, uh, was Professor Ineta Ziemele, and the title of the book is On the Methods of Interpretation of the EU Law. And I will try to read in Latvian, the Latvian, the title of this book. Europas Sabinibas Tiesas Interpretatias Methodes. And uh, <laughs> I understand it. <laughs> the book is being co-authored also by the, by the mm, Dr. Jose Antonio Gutierrez Fons, okay. and is published by the Latvian, uh, in Latvian by Tiesu Nemu Agentura. I think that is a good introduction to this uh, intellectual event, right? And I will now pass on mm. this uh, <coughs> microphone to the President Indian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? <coughs> yes, it does. <coughs> Now, before uh, we embark on the uh, agenda of today, I would like to thank you, all of you who have found time to come here. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure seeing so many people. And uh, before I give uh, the floor to the president of the Court of Justice, as well as then the translation team, with both sides on me, I had a pleasure to work for a year and a half very closely. Mm. Um, but I would like to, first of all, give the author and his colleague a book. Your mm -hmm. book, you need a book. Everybody <laughs> else has it. <laughs> so the uh, publisher is very... Ah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is... Thank you. Oh, this is... Uh, yes, I'm handing this really over to really the... Thank you so we much. Uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> really <laughs> impressive. <laughs> um. All right. Now, uh, since the authors, uh, um, uh, President Leonards, uh, and also on behalf of uh, Jose Gutierrez Fons, have the copies of their own books in the Latvian language, uh, with that, I can give you the floor for introducing to all of you who have the book but haven't read it yet, I imagine, uh, introduce to you uh, the book, which uh, I believe indeed will be a very important source uh, for Latvian lawyers and the mm -hmm. judges and will help us to uh, apply EU law at a, a new quality. Mm -hmm. So, yes. President, you have the floor. Thank you. Do I need... Um, have oh no, I have it here, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Mr. Rector, Mr. Minister of Justice, esteemed colleagues of the Constitutional Court, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Judge Ineta Zimele and her team 
for the tremendous work they have put in translating this book from French into Latvian in a rather short period of time. The book looks fantastic. I had seen it already on the screen of my iPhone. <laughs> Although I do not speak the beautiful Latvian language, I'm certain in the light of the professional skills of the persons participating in this project that the quality of the translation is, must be outstanding. I've been asked by the organizers of this event to provide a general overview of the book. However, before doing so, I would like to explain why I decided to write this book with my co-author, José Antonio Gutiérrez Fons, with whom I already work 15 years academically together. The reasons are threefold. First of all, I sought to explore in detail the methods of interpretation that the Court of Justice of the European Union employs so that the reader of the book could fully understand how the court exercises its role as the guardian of the rule of law within the European Union. Since the Court of Justice is to ensure that in the interpretation and application of the treaties, the law is observed, that's the literal wording of Article 19 of the Treaty on European Union, those methods of interpretation serve to explain how the court defines what the law is. The methods of interpretation indeed indicate the pathway that the court of justice follows to find the law. Second, academic literature literature has not recently explored the methods of interpretation of the Court of Justice in depth, some notable exceptions notwithstanding. I thought that the time was right to fill that lacuna. In so doing, I did not want to explore the methods of interpretation, delving excessively into philosophical and abstract questions that are difficult to grasp. Instead, I decided to go to the source and explain those methods by focusing on the case law of the Court of Justice. Thus, I favored a pragmatic and didactic approach when exploring these methods of interpretation. Third and last, it is important for the legal community to become acquainted with the way in which the Court of Justice builds its reasoning. Just as one needs an instruction manual to assemble a new piece of furniture properly, think about IKEA or something, <laughs> lawyers, judges and civil servants must become familiar with the methods of interpretation of the Court of Justice when confronted with a case that raises questions of EU law. As the union among the peoples of Europe becomes closer and closer, the areas where such an instruction manual is needed, become more and more diverse. To name just a few, cases concerning immigration and refugee law, private international law, criminal law, data protection, may raise questions of EU law. Accordingly, if lawyers and civil servants want to succeed in building a case and judges want to find the right answers to solve it, they have no choice but to understand how the Court of Justice thinks. That is why the book seeks to provide a reader with the basic keys to do so. My co-author and I wrote the book in French, hoping that the legal community that speaks the language of Molière would familiarize itself with those methods of interpretation. Now, thanks to Judge Zimele and her team, I'm happy to see that the same objective can also be achieved in the language of Rainis. <laughs> As a starting point of my overview of the book, I would like to highlight the fact that the treaties are silent as to the methods of interpretation that the Court of Justice must apply. It is therefore for the court itself to identify and determine the methods 
that allow it to uphold the rule of law within the EU. The case law reveals that the court has applied the so-called classical methods of interpretation when giving meaning to the provisions of EU law. I refer here to the literal interpretation, the contextual interpretation, and the teleological interpretation. As we observe in the book, those methods can also be found in both national law and international law, notably in the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. However, because of the specific features of the EU legal order, the weight that the Court of Justice gives to some methods may differ from that given by a national court. In addition, the Court of Justice has developed the EU legal order in keeping with the idea of autonomy. Autonomy means, in essence, that the EU legal order strives to find its own constitutional space, but without building walls that insulate that legal space from that surrounding it. EU autonomy is about preserving the values on which the EU is founded, whilst building bridges with constitutional traditions that are common to the member states and with universal rules enshrined in international law. Furthermore, unlike the treaties themselves, the last title of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union does provide useful guidance to the Court of Justice as to the way in which the Charter must be interpreted as a catalogue of fundamental rights. Indeed, Articles 51 to 54 of the Charter serve to guide the Court of Justice in determining when the Charter applies and how the exercise of fundamental rights may be limited, as well as the relationship between national fundamental rights the European Convention on Human Rights, and the Charter. It follows that the methods of interpretation employed by the court may be divided into three types. That is, the classical methods, those that seek to ensure consistency with national and international law, and finally, those that are specific to the Charter. That is why the book mirrors that three-pronged division, dedicating a chapter to each category. So let's first look into the classical methods of interpretation. And allow me to start with the literal interpretation. Just as happens in the legal systems of the member states, that method focuses on giving an ordinary meaning to the words contained in the EU law provision in question. Some authors have criticized the court by alleging that it does not pay enough attention to the black letter of the law, preferring instead to apply other methods, notably the teleological interpretation. They argue that that lack of attention is detrimental to legal certainty. I respectfully disagree with those criticisms that are both unfounded and misleading. They are unfounded because the Court of Justice adheres fully to the maxim interpretatio cessat in claris. But as a matter of fact, the Court has emphatically ruled, and I quote, an interpretation of a provision of EU law cannot have the result of depriving the clear and precise wording of that provision of all effectiveness. That is a very recent judgment of September 2022. Thus, where the meaning of a provision of EU law is absolutely plain from its very wording, the court cannot depart from that interpretation. Those criticisms are also misleading because they obviate the fact that the Court of Justice interprets the law in a multilingual setting. Since the principle of linguistic equality applies to EU acts of general application, in the event of linguistic divergencies, 
which occur rather frequently, the court of justice cannot limit itself to grounding its interpretation of the law in a literal interpretation, but must have recourse to other methods. Otherwise, paraphrasing George Orwell in Animal Farm, some languages would be more equal than others. So if you say in Latvian, it's clear, but it's not clear in Dutch, Greek, or Estonian, then we need to compare all these versions and search what's the context, what's the objective, in order to come to an, um, a meaningful interpretation. Allow me to illustrate this point by looking at a Latvian case called Air Baltic Corporation, decided back in 2014, and with that concerned the interpretation of several provisions of the EU visa code. The facts of the case are as follows. At border control at Riga Airport, an Indian citizen presented two Indian passports, one that was valid but without a visa, and one that was cancelled but with a valid visa. <laughs> he was refused entry into Latvian territory, and Air Baltic was fined on the ground that it had transported a person without the travel documents necessary to cross the border. Air Baltic challenged the fine before the Latvian courts, arguing that the EU visa code did not require the visa to be affixed to a passport that was valid at the time of crossing the border. If one reads the relevant provision of that code, the EU visa code, in Spanish, Estonian, Italian, and Latvian, a literal interpretation of that provision would militate in favor of that requirement, that it be fixed, a valid passport and a valid visa on the same document. However, the wording of the same provision in Danish, German, Greek, English, French, Lithuanian, Hungarian, Maltese, Dutch, Polish, Portuguese, Slovenian, and Swedish do not seem to impose that requirement. That's the advantage of being the Court of Justice of the European Union. We have equal access to all the language versions of any provision we need to interpret. So what to do? In the event of linguistic divergencies, a literal interpretation does not ensure either linguistic equality or the uniform application of EU law. Instead, the Court of Justice must rely on other methods of interpretation, such as the contextual and the teleological interpretations. In the case at hand, those two methods of interpretation opposed requiring the visa to be affixed to a valid passport. So in other words, Air Baltic won the case. Notably, the Court of Justice reasoned that the presentation of two separate tra travel documents did not put the competent authorities in a position where they would be unable to carry out, under reasonable conditions, the border checks required by EU law. There was indeed a valid passport and there was a valid visa, but it was on two documents rather than on one. Frankly speaking, the objective of controlling the substance of legality at entry on Latvian territory was totally ensured also uh, by that way. So that's for the literal interpretation. Now the contextual interpretation. There we argue in the book that preparatory works in French travaux préparatoires have steadily gained importance as a method of interpretation. This is because preparatory works have become publicly accessible. Previously, that was not the case. Now, transparency principle, everything as it should be, is accessible. Enabling the Court of Justice to rely on them in a transparent way. This is also because their quality has improved significantly, making them more useful for interpretation purposes. So the Court of Justice has relied on those pre preparatory works in seminal judgments concerning inter alia, the interpretation of treaty provisions introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon. 
Suffice it to mention cases such as Inuit Tapirit Kanatami concerning the interpretation of the notion of regulatory act for the purposes of annulment actions, Whiteman concerning the treaty provision allowing a member state to withdraw from the EU, and Italy and Comune di Milano against Council on the seat of the European Medicines Agency concerning the notion of institution for the purposes of Article 341 TFEU. In all these cases, the court referred to the works of the Convention on the Future of Europe, which went, was underway 20 years ago, 2002, and which led over the constitutional treaty that failed to the uh, Lisbon Treaty, which, as you know, is for 90% in identical wording than that failed constitutional treaty. This brings me to the teleological interpretation. At this stage, I would like to talk to you about what I have called the double fallacy on the basis of which some authors have criticized that teleological method. Those authors argue that the teleological method of interpretation has enabled the Court of Justice to commit acts of judicial activism that favor the maxim in dubio pro integratione, that is, in case of doubt, pro-European Union. However, I can tell you, and I speak under the control of my colleague, such a maxim does not exist either in law nor in practice. And I will try to set this out in the examples to come. First of all, on the one hand, there is no logical correlation between a court being activist and a court favoring an EU competence creep. In other words, you can be activist precisely to diminish the scope of union law, just as much as you can be activist to increase it. There is no logical co correlation. Activism relates to the role that a court is to carry out in a system of checks and balances, separation of powers, trias politica. When a court crosses the dividing line between law and politics, a court is being activist. There we all agree. Where a court encroaches upon the prerogatives of the legislature or those of the executive, the court is activist. Where a court takes away constitutional rights, the court is activist. This means, in my view, that a court can be activist regardless of whether it favors the competences of the EU or those retained by the member states. The case law of the United States Supreme Court provides a good example in that regard. For some lawyers and scholars, the Warren Court, that is a court of the 1950s and 60s in the United States, can be seen as an activist court that encroached upon state rights. Referring to the landmark ruling of Br Brown v. Board of Education, that is the ruling ordering the desegregation, racial desegregation of schools, public schools in the US, they argued, authors argued, that the Warren Court had excessively expanded constitutional rights to the detriment of state powers. Later on, some lawyers and scholars argued that the Rehnquist Court was conducting a federalist revival that sought to protect state sovereignty. In Lopez against the United States, for exa example, the US Supreme Court had, for the second time in 50 years, struck down a federal statute on the ground that Congress lacked the powers to adopt it under the US Constitution. Regardless of whether one agrees with the reading of the law by the Warren or the Rehnquist Court, or now the Roberts Court, the fact remains that some criticisms will wave the flag of judicial activism when the US Supreme Court favors federal powers, whilst others will do so when it favors state powers, like these examples show. In the Rehnquist Court, where a federal law was struck down in favor of state powers, they said it's activist because it goes against the federal legislator. In the Warren Court, it was state powers being limited in favor of the constitutional rights of black people, Afro-Americans. 
It was activist, but it did, in terms of the extent of the scope of left to state powers, the exact opposite. And in both cases, it was said to be an activist court. So what is really here essential is that the judicial activism can take different shapes and have many colors. But at the end of the day, what is important and what really matters is for courts to respect the dividing line between reading the law and engaging in policy making. And that all courts, the Court of Justice of the European Union, like the US Supreme Court, like the Latvian Constitutional Court, must respect. As to the second fallacy, I do not agree with the claims that the teleological method of interpretation, as I already said, goes hand in hand with pushing European integration forward. As we explain in the book, that method of interpretation is neutral, given that it limits itself to identify the true objectives pursued by the authors of the treaties, and as the case may be, by the EU legislator. The judgments of the Court of Justice in Dano and Alimanovic are excellent examples in that regard. In those two cases, the Court of Justice identified the objectives pursued by the EU Citizens Directive and ruled that those objectives opposed the so-called social tourism, thereby protecting the national welfare systems. So you see there, it's a protection of state powers, but a limiting of rights for people. It's looking the balance under the existing rules, teleologically. Moreover, the Court of Justice strives to interpret EU law in the light of international law and in the light of the constitutional traditions common to the member states. As described in the book, international obligations binding upon the EU become part and parcel of the EU legal order. The incorporation of those obligations is automatic, provided that they comply with the fundamental constitutional tenets of the EU. Those tenets relate to the values on which the EU is founded, such as the protection of fundamental rights. They also relate to the constitutional structure set out in the treaties. Notably, the Court of Justice has ruled that the EU system of judicial protection, of which the preliminary reference mechanism is the keystone, is an essential component of that constitutional structure. For their part, the constitutional traditions common to the member states pervade the entire body of EU law. Most importantly for present purposes, the values on which the EU is founded stem from those traditions. This means in essence that we Europeans share and cherish the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. This also means that we must stand up for those values. In the conditionality judgment, the Court of Justice made this crystal clear. It held, and I quote, the values contained in Article 2 TEU have been identified and are shared by the member states. They define the very identity of the European Union as a common legal order. Thus, the European Union must be able to defend those values within the limits of its powers as laid down by the treaties. As the Court of Justice held in Republica, a candidate state for EU membership must align its own constitution or basic law, including institutional and substantive provisions, with the values on which the EU is founded. The so-called Copenhagen criteria, which are now set out in Article 49 TEU, imply inter alia a strict control of those values. A candidate state for EU membership must commit itself to respecting those values for as long as it remains a member of the EU. That ongoing commitment means that there is no turning back the clock when it comes to respecting the values contained in Article 2 TEU. 
as the court held in the same conditionality judgments, I quote, compliance with those values cannot be reduced to an obligation which a candidate state must meet in order to accede to the EU and which it may disregard after its accession. The member states must respect those values, says the court, at all times. The national identity of a candidate state for EU membership must therefore be in keeping with the values contained in Article 2 the EU. Otherwise, such a state may not accede to the EU. Similarly, after accession, constitutional reforms or legislative measures that undermine the level of protection of those values constitute a violation of the principle of no regression. Accordingly, national identity cannot serve as an excuse to walk away from democratic principles, the rule of law and fundamental rights. National identity must be built and developed in keeping with EU values. National identity and EU identity must therefore be aligned. Authoritarian drifts can never be part of the EU legal order. That said, compliance with EU values allows sufficient room for national diversity. The ruling of the court in the seminal Coman case is a perfect example in that regard. In that case, with which we deal in the book, the Court of Justice was asked to interpret the notion of spouse for the purposes of the EU Citizens Directive, which did not define it. A comparative law study of that notion shows that there is no pan-European consensus as to whether it should include same-sex couples. For example, the Latvian constitution defines marriage as, I quote, a union between a man and a woman, whereas in Belgium, my home member state, same-sex marriages are legal. What about the EU law? Despite th that lack of consensus, should the Court of Justice endorse an EU-wide definition of spouse that would include same-sex couples, emulating the approach of the United States Supreme Court in Obergefell versus Hodges, Ohio? The Court of Justice did not follow that line. Instead, respecting national identity, it held that it is for each member state, according to its own identity, to decide the meaning of the institution of marriage. EU law is neutral as to whether that meaning should include or not same-sex couples. However, the exercise of such a margin of discretion cannot go as far as adversely affecting the free movement rights of same-sex couples that got legally married in another member state. For the sole purposes of the relevant provisions of EU law, those couples are to be considered spouses and thus members of the same family. Another good example is provided by the recent judgment of the Court of Justice in the Boris Cilevich and others case concerning a reference made by the Latvian Constitutional Court. In that case, the Court of Justice held that it is legitimate for a member state to protect its national identity by adopting measures that seek to promote and develop the use of the official language in higher education. In implementing that policy, the Court of Justice acknowledges that the member states enjoy broad discretion and I quote, since such a policy constitutes a manifestation of national identity for the purposes of Article 4, Paragraph 2, TEU. So you see here that the interpretation of European Union law itself creates the room for inserting the national identity concerns of the member states, which thereafter is valid not only for that member state, but also for all the other member states, availing themselves of the same claims to protect their national um, identity, linguistic identity. 
And I may add that as a Flemish Belgian, uh, we have the same concerns for our linguistic identity within Belgium, vis-à-vis uh, -vis then mostly the French community, then you might have it here uh, in another context uh, in Latvia. But it's interesting to see how these same concerns are also known elsewhere in Europe. Before closing, I would like to say a few words about the Charter. It will be very short. We decided to include a specific chapter on the Charter, that is the interpretation of the Charter. Not only because that catalogue of fundamental rights contains clear guidance as to the way in which its provisions must be interpreted, but also because the entry into force of the Charter has brought about an important change in the court's case law. Quantitatively, the Charter has increased the frequency with which fundamental rights issues are raised before the Court of Justice. Indeed, as a formal written document, the Charter has given greater visibility to fundamental rights in the EU legal order. That enhanced visibility has enabled judges from the four corners of the EU to become better acquainted with the EU system of fundamental rights protection. Today, approximately 15% of the cases brought before the Court of Justice concern the interpretation of the Charter. Qualitatively, the Charter has brought the Court of Justice and national courts closer to EU citizens, since every case involving the substantive application of an EU law provision, together with a fundamental right recognized by the Charter, calls upon judges to protect that right against unjustified limitations on its exercise. This often involves engaging in a balancing exercise between individual liberty and the common good. The Charter has therefore strengthened the role of judges as guardians of democracy, liberty and justice in the EU legal order, since judges are called upon to provide effective judicial protection of the rights that EU law confers on individuals, including those rights recognized by the Charter. Finally, the book draws the conclusion that there is no method of interpretation that the Court of Justice systematically favors over other methods. Whether a method has more or less weight in the reasoning of the Court will depend on the legal questions brought before it and on the EU law provisions at issue. That said, if it is possible, the Court of Justice will rely on those methods following a mutually reinforcing dynamic that enables it to build the most coherent and convinc convincing judgment that the law allows. I would like to thank again Judge Diemele and her team for the excellent work which allows us to stand here today and to bring this book on the methods of interpretation pursued by the Court of Justice of the European Union, the classical methods, literal, contextual, teleological interpretation, the relationship between national constitutional law and international law and EU law, and finally the Charter, the three main parts of the book, to bring all of this to the Latvian uh, audience. This is fantastic. We have done the same operation towards Hungarian, and the book will Friday be proposed in Budapest, and uh, later in the year, beginning next year probably, the same will be done in Spain. So it is very good, I think, that we can share and exchange, and when the Constitutional Court comes to bring a working visit to the Court of Justice next February, we will certainly be able to discuss on these methods and to also exchange what your methods are for finding the law, because in the end, that is what binds all judges together. That is to say what the law is. For us, the EU law, for the Latvian courts, the Latvian law, 
or the Nat Latvian constitutional court, we are all together in this, and that is which makes in this network of European courts binding 70 supreme and constitutional courts of the European Union into a single network, together, the judicial network of the European Union, uh, what makes us together support liberal democracy, the rule of law, and fundamental rights. That is the instruction manual, the toolbox uh, on our side. But we are very interested to learn about the toolbox on your side, and that is what gives me such a great pleasure to be here today in Riga. Thank you very much. Lils Paldis. <laughs> Many thanks uh, to the President uh, of the Court uh, of Justice. And uh, before uh, we have a, a little moment uh, to discuss uh, some of the uh, um, aspects brought forward uh, in the book and also uh, to give a floor to the uh, uh, team uh, that translated uh, the book, uh, I would really like to, to thank uh, President Leonard's um, well, for many things, actually. <laughs> um, he's on the way to, to Lithuania, to Vilnius, uh, to celebrate 100 years of uh, the Lithuanian constitution and 30 mm -hmm. years of uh, our um, uh, very close uh, uh, partners, the, the Lithuanian Constitutional mm -hmm. Court. And the fact that you stopped for a few hours, actually, uh, in Riga, to open your book, to meet with the Constitutional Court, to meet also with uh, the President of, of the Republic and mm -hmm. also some, some some other colleagues. The day is extremely packed uh, and I do mm -hmm. appreciate that really mm -hmm. um, because it does make it um, a different kind of opening mm -hmm. if we have uh, one of the authors uh, uh, present. Um, and also for the fact that um, crazy as it was at that moment when uh, uh, a good colleague and a friend of mine, Ilona, uh, at the conference we had together between the con uh, Court of Justice and the Constitutional mm -hmm. Court where I advertised <laughs> your book, <laughs> uh, that one. Um, and and uh, there was uh, this wonderful reaction on, on her part and then subsequently on the part of uh, our colleagues in mm -hmm. the court and the commission, uh, the Latvian lawyers, uh, linguist, linguist, and when I ran to you saying, we will translate it, <laughs> <laughs> you did not have a, you did not have a hesitation, but no. even more so, you have brought that idea further in Europe. As you already heard, uh, dear friends, uh, the book is going to be translated also into the other languages, and I'm I'm very happy it was a Latvian mm. initiative that yeah, generated yeah, the that Europe uh, yeah, Europe wide uh, impact. You so know, so I yeah. always like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now um, on the book. Um, as indeed we uh, worked on it, and there were uh, many challenges uh, about some of them. Uh, uh, you will hear uh, shortly uh, from uh, uh, Ilona Einars and, and Christaps. But uh, as I was um, uh, also sort of um, <laughs> reflecting conceptually, mm -hmm on a number of things, and uh, you do know that um, one of the points in the book um, that you make uh, makes me wonder. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the part on the relationship between European Union law and international mm -hmm. law, naturally. <laughs> you know very well. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. um, I have personally always thought, mm -hmm. uh, in my analysis, given the principle of autonomy mm -hmm. of the EU legal order, as well as uh, the way uh, European Union now mm -hmm. uh, ratifies when it decides so some of the international treaties and gives them effect uh, within the EU legal mm -hmm. order. To me, that has always, rem I have felt this is more uh, a dualist mm -hmm. approach. And historically, mm -hmm you can understand it because European Union, as a completely new idea, had to consolidate itself. Mm -hmm. And so it is therefore that in terms of its, the principles that structure 
the constitutional mm. uh, order of the EU, mm. such as, you know, primacy, autonomy, uh, uh, effectiveness. Uh, of course, they are also protective yeah. of that project. Mm. And so I was not surprised that in terms of relations with, with international law, unlike in Latvian constitutional mm -hmm. law, the European Union is more careful. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, mm. had, I had qualified that in my uh, examinations as more akin to dualist mm -hmm. approach. Now, when working on your book, <laughs> it's very obvious <laughs> that you define it, and as everybody will be yeah. reading it. <laughs> you define it as a as a monist mm. uh, system, and there we s we seem to be in tension, the two of us, which is very constructive <laughs> for the deliberation. Which, which eh? we, like happen, <laughs> we happen to be in tension. <laughs> exactly. <indeed. laughs> and then the other point mm. uh, is is something that is also important for the audience here today. It is the mm. principles that constitute uh, mm. EU legal order, sort of the structuring principles, uh, as we know, the le, 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 le principe con, uh, structurant, uh, sort of structuring principles of the of the EU legal order. One thing that I would also like you to comment, because it's true, the book is about the backbone of the EU legal order. It's a backbone. Mm. It's an extremely complex legal system. Uh, it is very easy to get lost uh, in it unless mm -hmm. unless you are the president <laughs> of the court of justice <laughs> but uh, for everybody yeah. else i find this yeah. is really you hold on to it to guide, and yeah. and then you can yeah. sort of yeah. navigate through the yeah. uncharted waters yeah. <laughs> for many of us um, but uh, if we were to expand a little bit more, for example, if you were con to continue, mm -hmm. add another chapter to, to, to your yeah. book, then uh, what I would think would be very useful is to reflect uh, on the methods of interpretation through the structuring principles mm -hmm. of the EU legal order. Because what I would like to uh, sort of leave in, in this uh, room mm -hmm. is, uh, to me, it is these principles, if I keep them in mind, that allows me to see uh, EU rules that are many, but in a more coherent mm -hmm. manner, and by then applying the methods uh, of interpretation as, uh, well, whichever provision we have to interpret in, in any uh, given uh, case. It is in the book, but I wonder mm -hmm. if there was an additional chapter projecting, you know, through that lens, mm. uh, through these not so many but several principles, the foundational principles mm. of the legal uh, of the legal order. Because of course, it's not a sovereign with a Grundnorm, as in a constitutional uh, yeah. system. Yeah. It's a, it's a different logic. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are my two reflections mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. as I was. Uh, working through <laughs> the book um, and as we had all these many meetings uh, with, with the team. I wonder whether hmm? you would like to, to yeah. respond to that. Thank you very much, Judge Zimele, uh, dear Ineta. Um, yeah, first is non-dualism, dualism or monism. Um, I absolutely agree with you that the European Union is a very special legal order and therefore also a very specific person of international law or subject of international law. It is not a state. The court said so expressly in this opinion two stroke 13. It's not a state. It's not aspiring to becoming a state. So it's something specific. Uh, it is true that in classical uh, writings of the EU legal order, it has rather be put on the side of monism. Um, so it's since the International Fruit Company case, 1972. And why is that so? Um, in a dualist system, the international law norm uh, enters the domestic legal order of a state, that's the classical case, through the adoption by the parliament normally of the norms contained in that treaty. They are implemented into national law, and then that treaty over the national law becomes part of the law of the land of that state. So that is sort of the paradigm of dualism. If you take that paradigm, technically speaking, that is not what happens at the level of the EU. 
it's, it's not to contradict you. It's only to explain why we have sort of this implicit background of monism. Because what happens at the level of the EU, that flows from Article 216 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and Article 218, the procedure of concluding, uh, you have to read the two together, concluding international agreements, it's the Council adopting a decision, but the decision contains three lines saying that the annexed international agreement is being concluded by the European Union. And that means conclusion, ratification, all the same. It is irrevocably bound as a consequence of that decision. And then that the agreement is as such entered in the domestic legal order of the European Union. So there is no transposition of that agreement over a regulation or a directive or any other internal act as they are uh, enumerated in Article 288, uh, the different normative acts of the European Union. So it is on that sort of very core level that we normally say this is a monistic system. However, I do agree with you that vis-à-vis -vis the European Union, that binary uh, system, modism or dualism, is not really appropriate in a way. Uh, so, because that council decision, it incorporates in a way the substantive content into the domestic uh, legislation of the Union. And although it is not captioned in a legislative act or an executive act or something of internal union law, it's nevertheless over that decision that it is incorporated. So you can there already see a beginning of dualism as well. But in legal literature, that is nevertheless more seen as the minority. In addition, you have the customary international law, where in any event, the union is bound uh, on under the terms of customary international law, the general international law, uh, since the case law of our courts over 50 years and more. Mm? So that is the reason why we say this. I do, however, recognize that there are also signs of dualism. For instance, since the Cadi, and we discussed that, the Cadi case law, where it is said that an international law norm can never contradict a constitutional um, sort of ground principle of the union legal order, a basic principle. So it may not undo the um, constitutional framework of the Union, for instance, in terms of fundamental rights protection, that was CADI, but also uh, possibly other um, element competence matters, etc. Or procedure of decision making, like in the CETA opinion, we said that if an international agreement in the trade sector were to diminish the level of protection for social protection or environmental protection, then the legislation needs to be changed first before such an agreement can be concluded. Why is that? It's in order to protect the autonomy of the legislator. That is, in a way, the legislator there has to decide whether that sort of an agreement may enter or not the union legal order. And that points to dualism, absolutely. So in that sense, the more recent case law is indeed developing. So I think for the next edition, we will have to uh, elaborate that further. And thank you very much for this. So I'm explaining how we came to that sort of classical approach. But it is clear that uh, in the most recent case law, there are also clear strands of dualism in that relationship. As far as the EU structural principles are concerned, yes, that is absolutely correct. If you take the matters of... Um, for instance, the principle of primacy or the preliminary reference procedure, the role of Supreme Courts, the obligation to refer, all this procedural matter is of course also relevant in the con because it's that which leads to interpretation. Uh, previously, it was always said the Court of Justice interprets union law and the national courts apply union law. I'm more nuanced. The national courts apply union law, that's clear. But the interpretation of union law is a shared responsibility between the national courts and the union courts. Because when a national court refers to the court of justice in order to obtain the definitive interpretation of a rule, 
that national court has already made an initial interpretation because how else could it have selected that particular rule or that particular principle as possibly relevant to the outcome of the case pending before that national court? That is already interpretation. So the interpretation is a shared responsibility between these courts. And so you're absolutely right. That pleads in favor of um, adding a perspective on these structural principles. I have, of course, that's maybe, uh, as academics, we, we all do this. I have my basic textbook, EU Procedural Law, which some of you may know, the OUP publication, which next year will come out in a fully reworked second edition. Um, there's a Lennart Gutmann Novak. Um, and there, of course, we do focus on that. But it would indeed be appropriate to also indicate in this type of um, uh, perspective uh, some of these principles because they really determine the procedural way uh, that uh, an interpretation of union law is coming about. Mm. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, there is another wonderful book. It's uh, Leonard's and uh, on EU constitutional law. But, but, but given the size of that book, <laughs> I do not issue any promises. <laughs> now, um, with uh, this many thanks, and I, I, I hope with this little discussion we had, you, you got a little bit of a hint, uh, you know, how you can also, and what you can uh, see in the book, and what you will see in the book, and how we can address these issues. Now, um, with this, uh, I would really like to uh, move to the language part, because uh, it was extremely challenging to translate from French uh, to uh, English, uh, the Latvian, the book, first English, maybe. Um, anyway, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, have worked, the, uh, the um, uh, team uh, of uh, Ilona has worked a lot. We have uh, ourselves been uh, really, um, in a way, struggling how to, for example, transmit, I will give you an ex example, contextual, our uh, second step, contextual interpretation, because if I use the uh, methods of interpretation in Latvian that we use, and also the the economy, uh, and and also the uh, the the structure structural interpretation that we use, that doesn't sit very easily with with what we have in Latvian language. So we've been working on that and trying to find <laughs> some <laughs> better outcomes. But there are many examples of this. And with that, I give the floor to to Ilona and the colleagues. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much. I hope this is on. Um, it is a great honor to be here to open this book, and it is so for several reasons. Uh, firstly, it is, uh, as has been mentioned already, it is the first book of its kind in, in Latvian. So uh, secondly, it has been written by two eminent lawyers uh, who have, in a certain way, we could say, described their everyday work. Yeah. So yes. given their job description. And thirdly, um, it is also a great honor for Einars and myself to open this book exactly here because we are former graduates of the RGSL. So this is like a homecoming. Um, I, I can say uh, that uh, the idea of translating the book, uh, which was born in my head, um, has been long cherished. It was really a, a, quick, a quick idea. We have to do it in, in Latvian. And then uh, uh, there were just two um, things. Uh, to convince the authors, <laughs> with help of Judge Diemele, that we need to do that in Latvian. And then to uh, convince my other five colleagues that uh, we will do it in quite um, short uh, term. Um, so um, I really have to thank you for, for the trust <laughs> and for the mutual trust from, from the colleagues who um, uh, trusted the idea and uh, yeah, we, have, we see the result. Um, I have to say that we had also quite interesting and, and fruitful exchange with Signa Terhova from the Tiesna <laughs> Magentura. Um, Signa was the person who was thoroughly looking after how well we expressed ourselves into Latvian. 
<laughs> coming and having quite a subs yeah, substantiated background of the of the EU law and on everyday basis translating from French, English, German, and, and other languages. So she made sure that what we say in Latvian that it is an understandable uh, Latvian for Latvian lawyers. Um, what I would like, I will, I will say a couple of uh, very general words about the terminology work, and then I will give floor to my colleagues Kristaps and Einars, who will give then some examples of, uh, of the struggle. Um, one of my favorite authors, uh, late uh, Umberto Eco, once said that translation is a betrayal against the source language. <laughs> <laughs> with, with all due respect, you have not been betrayed. <laughs> you have not been betrayed, but um, it is true. And undeniably, um, of course, he spoke more of the literary texts. But at the same time, it is still, um, it, is, it, it, it can be applied even more to a legal translation, because in the EU context, as you, as you mentioned, we, first of all, we work in a um, with many languages, it is a multilingualism that that rules the European Union. But also at the same time, we have to write that it is understandable for lawyers in 27 member states, mm -hmm. and that is that is that is always a challenge. So in a way, this was the interpretation of interpretation in in, in this book. Um, so, but of course, translation is um, is a difficult intellectual task because you have you have to preserve the message of Moliere and and <laughs> and uh, and uh, express it in the in the uh, in the words of of Reines. Um, and as the as the original book is easy to read in in French, but um, we had to make it sure that it is also read easy to read in in in, in Latvian. Um, Four years ago, Einars and myself, we recorded a conversation with then uh, judge of the European Court of Justice, now the president of Latvia, Egils Levitz. And this was exactly about um, Latvian um, legal language. And, and during this conversation, an, an interesting thought uh, was expressed, which I could paraphrase that. Um, the legal translation, in a way, is, is to make the idea behind the concept understandable to the source language speaker. Uh, and at times, it is probably a legal concept, a legal idea, which has never ever expressed, has been expressed in, 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 the, in the target language. Uh, as, as we said during the conversation, probably no one in Latvia has thought of this sort before. You, so you have to, you have to really transfer, uh, transfer the message. And this situation happens, I would say, it happens on an everyday basis in, 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 EU, um, in EU law text. And then even if you would have um, a concept that uh, you can easily recognize linguistically in, in Latvian, and there I will give an example. Uh, in French, we have, uh, we have um, acte administratif. We have the same uh, equivalent linguistically in Latvian, administrative act, but I can assure you the concepts are not the same. So even, even let's say, if we would like to be purists and, and applying um, Latvian words to um, foreign concepts, we not necessarily are able to do it every time when, when we see it. So um, even at the same time, we do understand being a small language. I mean, we don't have more than two million people in, in, in the whole of the world speaking Latvian. Sometimes we have to uh, really abstain from it and find um, a better solution than transferring one to one uh, of the concept. Um, you probably know that um, we have uh, also in Latvia. There's there's a company till that is that has well developed the translation uh, programs. Uh, also for for they have uh, participated in quite many uh, projects also of the of the Commission, and even we applied also uh, this uh, how to say modern application <laughs> uh, in in our work. Um, and here I may sound like a dinosaur. I would still say there's quite a lot of human effort or human input 
that we have to do, even if the machine has seen that legal text. So I think in, in that way, our profi profession still for some time will be uh, of the machine. <laughs> machine will give us great help, but not necessarily um, a, a perfect um, uh, result. Because as I said, uh, working in an environment where there are uh, 24 languages, 27 legal systems, on top of that EU system, that is always uh, a, a great challenge. I will now give a floor uh, to Kristaps, who will, um, together with Einar, will give some um, uh, real-life examples of uh, how, um, yeah, how, how challenging it was at times. Yeah, uh, thank you. Okay, um, uh, while I was reflecting on what uh, to uh, say on this occasion, um, uh, I witnessed a storm on Twitter, and it provided me with, with an answer. Um, <laughs> the storm was stirred up by a person who had just received a pet passport for uh, his cat or dog, and this uh, pet passport had a very strange word on it, Loloium Zeunex in Latvian. Um, the Twitter user wasn't happy. Um, um, he thought that, um, that, that the linguists have gone wild again and have <laughs> created a completely unnecessary word. Uh, now, in order to understand what the storm was about, you have to know a number of things. Um, first, pet passports are governed by EU regulation. Mm -hmm. um, second, we do not have a well-established word for pet in Latvian. Uh, we use often my zunix, but that's more domestic animal. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, this was the word that the angry user would yeah, have yeah. preferred on the pet passport. Mm -hmm. But um, the notions are different. The notion of a domestic animal is a broad one. Pet is a more specific category. Mm. We, um, in essence, pets are animals that we uh, that the keeper keeps for its own pleasure. Um, we may eat domestic animals. We usually don't eat our pets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, accordingly, the EU translators of the regulation had chosen this uh, slightly strange word, "loloim zunex." Now we can leave it open whether it's, um, it was the best solution, but, but uh, the term was there for a reason. Um, so you might wonder why I'm talking about pet passports and, and, and um, some discussion on Twitter today. Um, in my opinion, it illustrates a recurrent issue with EU legal terminology. Mm. Um, it is agreed by it, EU law is, uh, as was already said, an autonomous legal order with its own particular terminology. It is agreed by co-legislators and interpreted by judges from all the 27 member states. So uh, it is not attached to one single uh, legal culture, but uh, all 27 of them. Mm. It is in constant interplay with all of them. Um, as a result, uh, EU law often conceptualizes legal categories differently than domestic legal systems and often it looks uh, at the reality through a different analytical lens uh, and describes it in different legal terms. As has been stated by themselves, uh, it is a deliberate strategy uh, of the lawyer linguists uh, at the EU institutions, at the legislative institutions, uh, to coin neologisms, that is to say new terms, um, uh, new legal terms. Well, we at the court, lawyer linguists at the court, we do the same. Um, we too have to coin new legal terms um, for very spe yeah, specific exactly. notions of EU law. Um, terms like emanation of the state, mm -hmm. uh, individu individual concern, um, you cannot find those in the Latvian domestic system. Um, uh, these EU legal terms might seem alien and strange at first, um, but they are the result of a very careful reflection and they also are there for a reason. So uh, my message to the readers of the book would be, um, uh, but, also to, yeah, but also to persons who work with EU law in general, would be encounter those legal terms uh, with an open mind. They are there uh, not only to, cor for, to correctly understand EU law, but uh, they can also provide a richer understanding on, of law in general. So uh, they are a feature and, and not a bug. Yeah, thank you, that's my... Thank you, Christophs. I think that was a great introduction as well to my, to my part. Um, I wanted to share th two points that, as a lawyer linguist working in the court before joining the commission, but also translating this book. First, I wish I had this 
18 years ago when I was a student, <laughs> and sort of reading <laughs> in, a, in, a com in a comprised way, and we heard um, in the lecture of, of Judge uh, Leonard that sort of, sort of an almanac of approach, sort of reading yeah. to cases. We have thousands of cases every year, and how do you make yeah. sense of them? And since 50 years ago, I think so this was Billy then, for me it was, wow, it makes sense, really. When you read it like this, it really kind of fits together. Yeah. So, and that comes to my <laughs> comment as a, the court is the yeah, melting yeah. pot, not yeah. only of the legal systems and bringing together concepts, but also linguistically, the yeah, languages. Exactly. And the other for the Latvian translation, sort of a thin layer that we needed to add or wanted to add a sort of local source to make um, some things maybe understandable because they did not exist in the language before. Um, so on the first one, on the idea of the melting pot, sort of to translate one book, one movie, um, um, or a law, a piece of legislation, individually maybe, it's quite doable, quite okay, but to do it on scale, systematically, over the years in a large teams of translators between different institutions, mm -hmm. that's quite another challenge. How do you ensure consistency throughout? Mm -hmm. So yeah. remember in the um, early 2000s, we had to translate a key communitaire sort of mm -hmm. overnight almost. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we went and started working for the court and the law is based on citations and quoting. And so but we would say it differently, but we have to use that quote so that you can go back, yeah. look it up on Eurolex or in the national portals, what the law says, it has to be the same. And not always um, we would agree, you know, the language evolved, the understanding of the concepts evolved. So that brings me to the, well, I maybe give an example to that. Um, the word is of good faith, la or in translations coming from international law in Latvian, god pratiba, which sort of, hints to fair mind, uh, yeah. or glorious mind, could be. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I'll, I'll come to the, in the second part of how we solve this. Or another word, obstacle, that comes from the community treaty, even talking about freedoms of movement. Yeah. For us, commonly, we talk about limitations, or ero bejoim, tiesi ero bejoim. And then what do we do with the word obstacle that comes scherzlis? Historically, we, we didn't use that term to describe limitations. And then we thought, okay, we'll keep it because that's the special source of EU law. You know, it's the barrier, it's a, an obstacle to free movement. Mm -hmm. But the ideas, conceptual ideas behind it are you know, the same that we want to put in the more general term limitations. So we kept actually those, those sort of the historical evolution so that when you read the book about the fundamental freedoms, you will have the word scherzlis for obstacle. And later on, when you will read about the, the chart of fundamental rights, you have another one, a more general one. So that's um, where the special source, the local <laughs> translator comes in. Um, unlike legislation or a case that you translate, there's a fixed number of sentences. We can't change the volume. We can't sort of start describing things the way we want. It's one-to-one, -one basically. In this book, luckily, um, we can put translator notes or footnotes or sort of, we have the freedom to interpret a little bit. Um, and there were quite a few of those. And I think for especially for students, we try to give also a useful sources where we got those definitions. For example, um, mm. legislative summaries on the European portal. Something new that started uh, maybe a couple of years ago. It's one thing to read a directive or regulation of 200 pages long what is the essence of it? Now they started producing legislative summaries. So we gave those kind of pointers for everyone to quickly uh, get an idea. Um, and the, the final thought would be, how do we ensure consistency in this book? Because as you knew, um, you could see there's a number of lawyer linguists and translators working on it. How do we make sure that the words used in the beginning and the first mm. page are the same on the end? Mm. It's an agreement. It's sort of a social agreement between us that we use these terms, these concepts consistently. And in the society, in the legal system, it's also an agreement, but a much larger scale. It's not between six people, it's between millions of people. Uh, so it comes down to what we agree on, and we think this is a good word to describe that um, idea or mm -hmm. that legal phrase or a concept. So that would be it for me. Thank you. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. Uh, just to conclude on uh, on the work of uh, the translation, uh, I think you got uh, insight a little bit also more into the work of um, 
uh, lawyers, linguists uh, in the court, but uh, broadly, um, since uh, Anarsis is uh, from the commission, uh, you see how complicated the work is on the mm -hmm. daily basis, um, uh, indeed so. And then, of course, for the purposes of this book, uh, it was uh, not only the question of consistency throughout, but it was indeed the question of, uh, in the end, offering uh, the book in such a form, including the mm -hmm. footnotes, that the Latvian reader mm -hmm. would be able to relate to, Mm. Yeah, and that's the choice of terminology is, is based on that. And also sort of to understand it in a more comprehensible way, because actually we all have also 27 different traditions of publishing books. Yeah, <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's true. You know, so as our publisher knows it very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm. um, so uh, it, it's been uh, indeed uh, uh, more work than when you sent me that message, <laughs> probably we anticipated. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much more than, than that. Um, okay, now uh, is uh, the moment also for the uh, uh, audience. If you would like to ask uh, a question to the, the president of the court, uh, to the team that is uh, offering you uh, the book, uh, now is the moment. And uh, um, I also know that some of you may want to approach the president individually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will no, organize no, no. all of that, not to worry. No. But uh, any questions from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the room, so to say? Anything that uh, interests you? Yes, Minister. I have one question, so are you happy now? <laughs> 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 I'm extremely happy, um, <laughs> and I'm happy for the way which Latvia showed with this book, because it must be stressed, it's having seen the dynamism of this team, it's really your credit and the enthusiasm, that we decided also to do it in other member states. And by the way, I forgot to mention also Poland. Right. The Polish version is almost ready as well. Huh? Poland, Hungary, Spain. So that is very good. But you show the way. I'm extremely happy and extremely proud of the quality of the team. And the way you spoke was really impressive for me. Thank you very much. It reflects that you have been in this book. <laughs> it gives me yeah, modesty and Right. Huh? Mm. Yeah, any other questions? Is the there is a question, yeah, Christos. Uh, thank you very much for introduction to the book. And I have not read it yet, so uh, my question will be on the basis of what you said. Mm. When we talk about interpretation of uh, legal provisions in Latvian legal system, we always use four classic methods of interpretation. So my question is about the absence of the systemic method of interpretation and what you were talking about. And uh, with specific reference to perhaps uh, general principles of law as well, because the mm. Latvian Constitutional Court de developed kind of its own theory on general principles of European Union law in the judgment that was adopted yeah. as a response to the point de penalité uh, judgment of, of the Court of Justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, d how do general principles come in? Which method of interpretation brings us there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, in fact, it is, of course, present in this book as well, and also in the methods of interpretation of the court. That is why we um, referred for better or for worse, as I said, we divided our material in three parts. The classical methods, and that is indeed in, in sort of a standardized quote since 50 years, text, context, and objective. But then, next to that, we said there is the source of the constitutional traditions common to the member states, and international law. That has been historically the source of unwritten principles, general principles of EU law. 
think about the fundamental rights protection before the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It was derived from the constitutional traditions common to the member states and from the European Convention on Human Rights, also from other instruments, international law instruments protecting fundamental rights. But those two were the sources of protection. And if you take the present Article 6 of the Treaty on European Union, TEU, it still speaks. People think it has been crossed out, but it has not, even after the existence of the Charter. That fundamental rights, as they flow from the constitutional traditions common to the member states and the European Convention on Human Rights, which is expressly mentioned as general principles of EU law. So the link of these general principles, which are unwritten principles and which have come in the case law, it finds its, its way there. So it's a matter of structure. So when we have a random um, regulation which needs to be interpreted, we take the text of that regulation, we take the context defined as the preamble, which sets out the context, sometimes other uh, legal instruments in the landscape of which that specific regulation is to be seen. It's all context, travaux préparatoires, that's all context. And then the objectives, as we find them in that text itself, but also in the treaty article, which serves as the legal basis for the adoption of that text. But then next to that, we have these two other parts of the book, that is the general principles of law, who find their source, roughly speaking, unwritten in these constitutional traditions and in international law instruments to which all the member states adhere, and then the Charter now, which is the third place, because, of course, everything which we interpret of union law must be compliant with the general principles and with the Charter. So that is really the structure of the book. And, and so it is present, but it is when you take a random text and you, the court announces its interpretive um, uh, sort of course of action, you'll file text, context and objective. But very often then also charter rights or general principles of another nature. If you want a recent example of this, then you can refer to the famous CONSOP case. The CONSOP case is a reference for a preliminary ruling from the Corte Constitucionale, which led in 2021, last year, to a grand chamber judgment of our court uh, interpreting the regulations on um, the regularity of financial transactions uh, on the market and then also the provisions of that uh, regulation um, or that regulatory framework uh, requiring member states to have um, effective, dissuasive, yet proportionate sanctions. But the question there was when the administrative authority is um, investigating into possible um, uh, breaches of that um, regulatory framework of the European Union with a view to possibly imposing such sanctions, does the undertaking have the right to remain silent? The regulation did not say much about it, but it had, of course, to be seen uh, effective, dissuasive, yet proportionate sanctions. We said, yeah, these sanctions can be so heavy that they are, under the Engel criteria of the European Human Rights Court, of a criminal nature. Ah, that triggers in turn the general principles of EU law on the fairness of these procedures. And of course now, since 1st of December 2009, the Charter rights from Article 47 till 50 of the Charter. And so that is then drawn in. We said text, context and objective of that regulation as such is insufficient. We need to draw in those aspects. And that's why you see extensively in our judgments an article of a random regulation directive or, or whatever read in the light of. And then it comes a general principle or a charter right, etc. And that leads to the outcome. And in that very case, by the way, we decided that the right to remain silent had to be guaranteed also in the administrative procedure, but which could lead to criminal type of sanctions within the human rights uh, court's uh, case law, in the meaning of that case law, um, 
So there was the right to remain silent. So that's, a, uh, I think, a beautiful example. It's CONSOP, C-O-N-S-O-B. CONSOP, you find it when you plug it in on your Lex, you have immediately the case, there is only one such case. <laughs> Um, well, uh, is it a, a short question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and a short answer. Yeah, sorry for <laughs> taking time, but uh, I have a question to lawyer linguists, mm, actually. I see we have uh, representatives from the, from the court and from the commission, but mm -hmm. there are also lawyer linguists in the council and the parliament. Mm -hmm. How do you work together? Do you have some institutional forum or you just, for instance, you, you mentioned the term, specific terms. Uh, have you uh, decided them uh, with, uh, with um, other colleagues? And yeah, thanks. Yes, I will be very short. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can assure you that um, I do not think that there are regular <laughs> meetings between the uh, different corps of, of the lawyer and linguists uh, of the different institutions, but um, th there are, uh, now and then there are meetings on uh, on bigger terminolo uh, terminology issues like uh, and, 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 and things like that, which, which would be the best um, example, yeah, uh, uh, and how to, how, to, how, to, how to do it. I think that, uh, in a way, how we follow each other's work is that we read each other's um, translations. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is, this is, um, this is the, um, this is, yeah, this, this is how it, uh, this is how it happens. Um, well, uh, as you will read in the uh, foreword, uh, to uh, the book, uh, there is indeed uh, still um, a lot of uh, work. I mean, there are many, many options when we think about enriching Latvian legal language through the prism of uh, application of the EU law. Trust me, uh, the field is all there and very open. And uh, it is not so many people in Latvia, I see how Signa looks at me, <laughs> who have gone through that and have experienced uh, uh, this incredible work. And so uh, I do invite you to those, especially those of you who are interested in uh, Latvian legal language, to actually give a thought to that. You know, how does that relate with all of the other languages uh, and that we use in the EU law? Um, it's it's a lot of work. It's it's yeah, actually it's monumental. Yeah, listen. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to really thank the, the president, uh, and I would really like to thank the team of uh, translators of the EU institutions. Uh, I would like to thank the the, the publisher. Um, I'm really really happy for the work we have together on a number of yeah. books <laughs> as yeah. we speak. Um, and to all of you for your interest, uh, for the presence today, and with that I would like to conclude the opening, the launch of the, of the book by President uh, Lenards and by uh, Dr. Uh, Gutierrez Fons on the methods of interpretation of the EU law. And if those of you who would like to have a word with the president, he's yeah. still available before I steal him further. <laughs> 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 but uh, with that, uh, I wish you a good reading of the book, good use of it, and uh, a good application of EU law in your daily work, because you are all EU lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I don't know how I can thank you. It's, uh, it's that's the real thanks. It's you. It's uh, and the publisher.